Well, why don't we get started? Uh, let's start by giving you time to turn in your Bibles to the sixth chapter of Matthew. Prayer. Father, we, come, we bow before you this morning with thankful hearts uh, for all the good gifts that you give us. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Uh, thank you for uh, the body of Christ, which you formed for yourself at great cost. And we are mindful of the members of the body among whom we are. And so uh, we, we rejoice in each other this morning and the work that you accomplished in our hearts, uh, that you love us so much, you sent your son for us. So this is a special group uh, here, the body of Christ, and we pray for uh, the entire body of Christ of Believers Chapel and, and really that you would give blessing, give healing. We have some who are sick, some who are grieving, and we pray your peace, especially to the Stutz family, uh, to Janae Waldhart and others. Uh, thank you for the healing graces and mercies that you're showing to many. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, our spiritual condition, that in the midst of a dark world, we might be shining lights, uh, that we might uh, proclaim the gospel in our conduct, uh, in our word and deed. Uh, Father, we have an election coming up, and we pray for our country, and uh, we ask what a comfort it, it is to us to know that uh, you lift kings up, you take them down, you put a hook in their nose, and you steer them wherever you desire and in your perfect will. And we are so thankful that whatever happens Tuesday is your perfect will. Uh, but we pray for your mercy, not that we as a nation are deserving of anything better than what we've got. Uh, the truth is we're not, but... but uh, we pray that in your mercy and grace, you would give us good leaders in all the branches of government and all the levels, national, state, local, um, and that uh, we might uh, abide by what you do in this election in a way that brings glory to you and uh, that we might find reason, as Paul uh, encourages us to rejoice always. Uh, so no matter what happens, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whenever we find out winners, uh, Lord, may we be able to rejoice knowing that your sovereign hand is in it. And now as we <clears throat> uh, look at this passage, Lord, we pray you'd enlighten us, that you would teach us, that you would sanctify us in it for Christ's sake. Amen. So we're studying uh, the Lord's Sermon on the Mount and with the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we come to a shift in the Lord's emphasis. Matthew doesn't provide the transition the Lord undoubtedly used. Instead, he goes straight to the point in verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The first half of this sixth chapter divides logically into three sections, with the, the second section serving as a kind of side template about prayer. Since he's speaking of prayer, we usually refer to it as the Lord's Supper. Uh, but the rest of the material in the sixth chapter, I believe, at least up through verse 18, can be accurately categorized as in the title of our lesson, living life in the presence of God. Our Father in heaven is always watching us. He always knows us, whether we acknowledge it or not. We are living in our lives in His presence, but He would have us live as if we were aware. Uh, we have colloquialisms. Uh, we use to express such a, a life. We're an open book. Uh, we live in integrity. Integrity commonly defined as how we, who we are when no one is looking. But God is always looking. 
There's a very interesting exchange in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, toward the end of that long chapter one. Uh, the men who would become Jesus' disciples are coming to him one by one. And John describes how Jesus found Philip, and Philip followed him. Then Philip went and brought Nathanael to the Lord. And as they approached him, Jesus addressed Nathanael, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And of course, Nathanael responded in surprise, How do you know me? And the Lord answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you standing under the fig tree. I saw you. And Nathanael, who perhaps was the only one who knew he had just been standing under a fig tree, immediately responded, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. It was one of those flashes of self-revelation of deity, the Gospels report, in which the Lord exhibited the attributes that only God possesses. God knows everything. And though Nathaniel might not have been aware, when he was under that fig tree, he was living in the presence of God. And his response to Jesus reflected that realization. In Psalm 139, David muses upon God's knowledge of him. He writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. Job, uh, struggling to understand his life experience, uh, knew that God was not unaware and he spoke repeatedly of God's constant observing of him. He knows the way I take, Job said in Job 23.10. His eyes, this is Job 24.23, his eyes are on my ways. Does he not see my ways, Job asked, and number all my steps? Our Father in heaven is everywhere and in every place. It should be our ardent desire to please Him, and yet too often uh, that is the furthest thing from our minds. Instead, foolishly, we become performers before an audience of our sinful, weak human peers. And that is what our lesson is about this morning. The previous chapter closed, remember, with this piercing command from the Lord you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And here is the connection with chapter 6. He knows our propensity to self-deception, our inclination to pretend we are who we are not. And Jesus issues this warning, beware of that. Beware of that. So let's read the passage, and as we read it, I do want you to notice some words that are repeated throughout by the Lord, and they underscore his intent here. Uh, watch how often he mentions the Father, and in secret, and noticed by, or honored by, or seen by men. Notice how often he uses the word hypocrite, and also reward. Verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners 
so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So now we're going to skip the Lord's Prayer. We'll come back to it at another time. And go down to verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, the introductory uh, verse of chapter 6 is meant to give us the general principle of what follows. The point is that the spiritual activities that we engage in are to be done before God and not to be noticed by men. They are not to be performances for other people to see and admire. There should be a deep sincerity to the actions we undertake in the spirit of worship and service to our Lord. Those actions have their own reward. So sincerity is an ethical theme that colors the entire discourse. And I I suspect that we all wish we could say that in what we do and say, we're sincere. I would think every one of us would have that uh, desire. Uh, It's just that weak and sinful impulses often intervene in our hearts to make us less than sincere. The derivation of the word helps us to understand what it means. It comes from the Latin sin sere, or without wax. When sculptors of stone would make a mistake in their sculpting, they could repair the error by applying wax to the misshapen portion of their piece of of work. And it would make their sculpture appear as the artist wanted it to appear. So you can see how a sculpture sincere without wax was one that had no such false appearance. It was unalloyed in its representation. Such is the life the Lord recommends uh, that is pleasing to Him, a life without false appearances service to Him and worship of Him without affectation. And he gives three illustrations in the sermon. You notice them as we read, giving, praying, and fasting. And the first is giving to the poor or the underprivileged. Another word for that, in fact, it is the word, is almsgiving. Uh, That's a word we don't use as much today, but it derives from either or both of the Latin and Greek words for compassion or mercy. It's an act of compassion to the poor. Now, for those who heard the Lord on this day, the Sermon on the Mount, the lesson they learned was not so much that they should give to the poor. They already knew that. Uh, The Old Testament repeatedly enjoins God's people to help the poor and the helpless. But but Jesus was concerned not so much with generosity as with attitude and motive. When you give to the poor, Jesus says, don't sound a trumpet before you. Now, he may have meant that literally, uh, but it's more likely the Lord only meant it figuratively because like today, trumpets were often blown to draw attention to something important that is happening. 
in the synagogues, in the synagogues of the Jews, they would place, and this is coincidentally, they would place trumpet-shaped metal receptacles within the synagogue, much like the ones in the court of the Gentiles that you've been taught uh, in the temple, situated so that those who brought their money in to give could pour it into these metal receptacles. And of course, these coins uh, would make a clanging noise, kind of like the metal trays on a, a slot machine in a, in a casino, designed to draw the attention of others. You clang, 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 and you look over there and, man, someone's won a lot of money. <laughs> I want to go play that slot machine. Or he, in this case, man, that person is giving a lot of money. Listen to it, it clanging. So everyone looks to see what's going on over there. The Lord mentions the streets also, and, and even more public place. So perhaps he had in mind a kind of almsgiving involving uh, beggars on the street corners, and the hypocrites, he refers to, would make an ostentatious display of generosity uh, to give alms to the poor person. He calls them hypocrites in each of these three illustrations. There's several words that he repeats in each of the three illustrations. Hypocrites is one, and we all know what a, a hypocrite is. It's someone who pretends to be something he's not. And here they're pretending that they care about the poor and the needy, but the reality is the real impetus behind their giving is that they're seeking to be honored and admired by men, by others. So it looks like one thing, but in reality, it's something very uh, different. You may recall a, a preacher or a Bible teacher explaining the word hypocrisy or hypocrite, where that word comes from. It was a classical Greek word that was used for actors playing a role on the stage. They were only playing this role. They were literally under a, a mask. And from the lips of the majestic Son of God, there could hardly have been an epithet more scathing than that. You are not who are you are pretending to be. But I must say, let's look in the mirror. Uh, these plain words of our Lord sadly seem to have little effect on the professing church today. It's understandable that it would be the way of the world. Worldly people seek honor wherever they can get it. it. It's a staple of both public and private institutions to raise money for their objectives by promising public honor to those who give. And we see their names on buildings and parks are named after them. And lists of donors or, you know, when we come to the gala uh, and you get the program, lists of donors are listed in proportion to the measure of the gift that they've given, platinum, gold, sorry, silver and bronze, uh, but there's your name, it's there. And so this is the trumpet sounding of the world. It's, pr it's a proven method. But the utter scandal, and I use that word intentionally, is the gigantic blind spot in the church where we see the world's methods wielded by believers who think that God is unable to give them what is necessary for their mission without such gimmickry and base appeals. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> because it's a very sad thing, very widespread, and those who speak against it are thought of as fundamentalist, stone age, stick in the muds who don't live in the real world. On the other hand, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And there are more subtle ways of seeking the honor of men from impure motives. A common one is to draw attention to your own pure practices so often that People suspect you're beating a drum to draw attention to yourself. Well, you know, we never beg for money in our church. We only pass the offering plate in the evening meeting. 
You don't think that isn't a conversation that has taken place more than a few times, including by yours truly. Which is worse, beating a drum or sounding a trumpet? In either case, Jesus says, the honor accrued by such hypocrisy will prove to be all the benefit they'll receive. They have their reward in full, he says. They get what they were after, but that's all they will get. Now, that verb he uses, they have their reward. This is very interesting. We just read it, they have their reward. But that verb was used at the time in a technical sense of a commercial payment indicating a fully paid invoice. The bill was paid in full, in other words, and, and there would be nothing more coming. Paid in full. So that's the negative side of things. But in verse 3, the Lord uses a kind of hyperbole in order to set forth the quiet and secret way he would have his followers give. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Authentic Christian righteousness is not so much external as internal, uh, the internal righteousness of the heart. This is similar in force to what the Apostle Paul would later say in his epistle to the Romans at the end of the second chapter when in the process of arguing that all have sinned and are guilty before God, you remember this, he condemns the hypocrisy of the Jews while identifying the true Jew. He writes, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision simply an outward thing, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. The outward versus the inward. We struggle with that. Uh, Self-awareness is something that just comes naturally to us, and yet we're not to be self-conscious in our giving. Our left hand is not supposed to know what our right hand is doing. Our Lord's expectations for us go far beyond the examples that we see in the world. They penetrate our heart. I want to ask you a question. Uh, Have you ever written a check to give to the Lord's service and you want to do it anonymously? You want to do it in secret? You want to do it for the pure reason of the purpose of the gift to promote the Lord's ministry but through the church or an organization, or or helping someone. You want to do it as only unto the Lord with this grateful heart, only to feel it creeping in, (laughs) that sense of self-satisfaction and and self-regard. Your focus has so suddenly and naturally shifted from the eyes of your Father in heaven who made the gift possible in the first place Back to, man, you are some kind of a fine Christian man. (laughs) That's how fast an act of service to God can turn to self-congratulation. And there it is. You got your reward. Paid in full. That's despairing. Some people are bothered by this idea of reward, but that's what Jesus maintains. Look, when you manage to give it in secret, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But this has bothered some who suggest that this is simply uh, replacing one form of vanity with another. Now we're performing uh, some good deed, not necessarily to be noticed by men, but in order to receive some kind of a reward. And the rewards of the Bible, uh, the, the rewards the Bible speaks of that come to God's people are, in one sense, difficult to understand. You know that. You who've been a Christian for a long time, 
studying your Bible for a long time, it's a head scratcher uh, when you start reading about rewards that come to us. The, the, the thought is marvelous, however, that God would give us something, some attitude, some good work, some ability to serve Him in a pure way, and then turn around and reward us uh, for it. It's part of the puzzle. But I wanted to say this about 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, because it relates. Uh, this is how the apostle addresses it in a, in a different way. Remember there in 1 Corinthians 4, he's refer referencing this future day when the Lord will come, and Paul says he's going to disclose the true motives of men's hearts, and he says, then each man's praise will come to him from God. What a wonderful thought that one day God might praise you. That's an amazing thing. That's quite the reward. And it's part of the puzzle of that lovely ending verse in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, our favorite passage, that our salvation is all by grace, not by works, and we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, and then He rewards us for those good works He gives us. It's a mystery, uh, but one I think Dr. Johnson penetrated as well as anyone in his lesson on this verse, and Dr. Johnson wrote this. It's a little long, but I think it's worth it if you listen intently. He wrote, if there is no goal in life that provides a gain, then the action that we do is in futility and meaningless. If what we do is not good for something, it's good for nothing. And for that reason, there must be Christian reward. Absence of rewards and absence of punishment permits injustice to have the last word. What's the good of being good, someone has said, if there's no such thing as eternal punishment? And so the natural product of that, uh, of that which pleases God in its consummation is Christian rewards. Christian rewards are the activity in its consummation, and they are the natural things which we should expect. We do labor with the incentive of Christian reward. So this is one of the words you notice repeated in all three of these illustrations, and it applies to all three in the same way. Jesus' second illustration comes from the act of praying. So we're shifting now to verse 5. And as you know, that will lead into the Lord's Prayer, which we're going to consider, Lord willing, in a lesson all its own. As with almsgiving, Jesus was not discouraging prayer, only its misuse. The Lord was the ultimate prayer warrior, rising up early in the morning to pray, at times praying throughout the night, praying intensely and with passion to His Father in heaven. Later, the apostles were insistent that believers were to pray without ceasing, uh, but here again, he highlights the abuse of prayer. Verse 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they might be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So here again in prayer are the hypocrites. The Lord seemed to have a special distaste for hypocrites. And here they are once more in the synagogues, and once more they're out on the streets, uh, praying. But it's not that they love to pray, though they say that. Pr praying can be a, a challenge. I've noticed how often, and you have too, I bet, how often Dan 
uh, reminds us of that. But the right we have from God to commune with Him in prayer is a great privilege. And when we enter into it in the right manner, it's a time of, of comfort, of, of joy, of worship. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. These hypocrites may love to pray, but as John Stott wittily observed, it is not prayer which they love or the God they are supposed to be praying to. No, they love themselves and the opportunity public praying gives them to parade themselves. They wanted to be seen by men. It was their desire to receive the praise of men that led to their ostentatious praying. What they really wanted was applause, and they got it. And again, Jesus insists they have their reward in full. The reality is uh, public prayer, you just heard me give one, can be abused and offered for impure reasons. Private prayer too, but especially public prayer. We've all heard the, the flowery, uh, artful prayer of the pretender, the the gift of gab uh, enables them to seemingly pray with, without end and, and orate as if giving a prepared uh, speech. And then there's the, the seminary teacher who teaches class in his prayers. I don't mean he's really a, a seminary teacher. He just acts like one as he uh, recites his voluminous knowledge of doctrine for the edification uh, not of God, but of his audience. I had a real seminary professor in school who, whose prayers were warmly uh, real. He did not orate. Instead, he was thoughtful. He would pause to gather his, his thoughts. Uh, he, he, he was passionate and real. He struggled for words and he spoke not to us, but to God. I'll never forget him, Walter Bodine. I know you've heard the, that story of President Johnson, LBJ, asking his press secretary, Bill Moyers, to pray before a family meal. And as Moyers was praying, President Johnson interrupted him, Bill, I can't hear you. Mr. President, I'm not talking to you, Moyers says. <laughs> But the Lord had in mind not only the abuse, this is really the Jewish clerical class, not, he had in mind not only them, he mentions the Gentiles too. Look at verse 7. Uh, the, the pagans often thought that they could get the attention of their gods by meaningless repetition, uh, surmising that by piling up words they would impress the gods. And so here's a warning for those of us who think our prayers must be long with the result that even when we've run out of things to pray about or, or doctrine to expound, we start all over and <laughs> repeat it all over again, like the chorus of a song that never ends. What he or she doesn't realize is that all those people he thinks he's impressing have either fallen asleep or they're thinking about their plans for the next day. Where are we going to lunch? Well, I know, I only know about these shortcomings because I've so often been guilty of them myself, seriously. Uh, prayer is hard, especially public prayer, and our minds do wander. It's a problem, isn't it? Deep in prayer and suddenly we're on another planet. We're wrapped up in the office or in the family or in the child. Uh, most of us have a little attention deficit disorder in it. It doesn't take much to distract it. Uh, the, the fly lands on President, Vice President Pence's hair during the debate, and it, everything he said after that just vanishes into thin air. That fly. Dr. Reuben Torrey, the great Bible teacher of the late 19th and early 20th century, used to say that we should never utter one syllable of prayer, either in public or private, 
until we are definitely conscious that we have come into the presence of God and are actually praying to Him. And Jesus offers a suggestion to help us in verse 6. Don't pray to impress others. Pray in secret, where no one on earth knows that you're lifting up your heart to God. There's no earthly reward for that unless you slip and you just can't resist uh, telling others about your quiet time and how early you get up <laughs> to, to do it and how you conduct it and all the rich fruit that can be had if only everybody else would pray like you do in private, then you'll get your reward for sure, paid in full. But when you exit the public eye and enter into your private place, wherever that may be, it may actually be a little closet or small room, and there you enter into co communion with God, you can be sure that your Heavenly Father, who truly does see you there, will have a reward for you. And that's the irony, isn't it? Only when you don't seek a reward will you receive one. Only when your primary objective is to seek the company of your Father in heaven, as a child might long for the warmth of his mother and father, will we actually find him there waiting for us. And in the finding, we experience the unconscious reward of fellowship with him. That was the psalmist's sentiment in Psalm 27. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. That is the Christian's attitude toward prayer. We don't have to be like the posers in our prayers or like the pagans with their futile repetition. As Jesus says in verse 8, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And that's another fantastically profound thought, which if we only believed it would transform our prayer life, but it's an idea we're going to pick up later in the study in verse 32. So I'm going to save our serious thinking about that until then. The Lord's third illustration of practicing our righteousness before men instead of before God is the spiritual exercise of fasting. Fasting is much like prayer. It is something prescribed in the scriptures for the purpose of seeking God's face. Like prayer, Jesus doesn't issue a command to fast, but rather assumes it's practice. He says, whenever you fast. And like prayer, fasting can be misused. There was a calendar that controlled certain activities of the Jewish faith. It prescribed certain feast days and months and weeks, particularly particular rituals to be observed, and also certain times of fasting. The church doesn't have a calendar. That may surprise you when you reflect on the institutional church, which does have calendars, some more strictly observed than others, but the lack of specific commands to fast at certain times compels New Testament believers to make their own determinations on when it's appropriate or even necessary to fast. These may be times when faced with important decisions, when we're really seeking God's will in a matter or as an expression of repentance or for some other purpose that moves a believer to seek the face of God in such a special expression. And as with prayer and acts of mercy, Jesus condemn the practice of doing it in order to draw attention to oneself. And since as we're running out of time, I'm not going to reread 16 through 18, but that's the gist of it. Uh, using the same formula, invoking the same repeated phrases as in the other two illustrations. For reasons I can't fully explain, I suspect we don't have a lot of fasters among us. But perhaps it's because those of us who fast are always anointing our heads and washing our faces so that we're not noticed. 
or it could be because many of us ignore the, plain, the Lord's plain expectation that we will at times fast. Stott suspected that some of us live our lives as if, if these verses had been torn out of our Bibles. But as the Lord uh, emphasized, uh, but the Lord's emphasis again is not so much on the necessity of fasting, but upon our attitudes when we do fast. Like with almsgiving, like with prayer, we are to do it as unto the Lord and not in order to receive the praise of men. We should fast as if we are living our lives in the presence of God. So in closing, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, provides a peek into a great cosmic reality. Here's what it says. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth so that he might support strongly those whose heart is completely his. The Christian life is not a show, an opportunity to advance one's reputation or garner the admiration and honor of others. It is rather a journey, sometimes a, a grueling marathon lived out, as we've said before, before an audience of one. Before an audience of one. The Christian life is to be lived as if Jesus Christ has done something for us. And now in thanksgiving, we offer him the gratitude that's due him. Only then will what righteousness, what righteousness there might be in our gratitude by his grace be a completely transparent righteousness because the real beauty of righteousness must not be tarnished by sham. And so may the Lord in his grace uh, make us practitioners of true righteousness, a righteousness conceived out of his work in our hearts, energized by his spirit alone and performed before his eyes alone. That is a good exhortation for us all. And so, Father, we pray our weakness in living this kind of life, in uh, attaining to this kind of active righteousness in our lives. We need your help. Uh, as a body, we confess this morning that we fall far short, and we pray that you would fill us with the kind of uh, awe at your grandeur and the beauty of your holiness and your attributes that our obsession would not be with pleasing men, but with pleasing you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.